Good evening. I'm Andrew Perchuk, Deputy Director of the Getty Research Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's program, Imaginaries of LA, Edgar Arsenault and Julian Myers, Shupinska in Conversation. I'm also thrilled that according to my screen, there are well over 100 people attending. Uh, and that I get to introduce a program from an artist, Edgar Arsenault, and a writer, curator, Julian Meyer Shapinska, whose careers I've followed for many years. When I first arrived at the Getty Research Institute, the Getty, in some ways, pretended that it was not really part of Los Angeles. Uh, but over the last 20 years, an engagement with Los Angeles has been one of our primary focuses, not only through the two Pacific Standard Times, but through the collection of the archives of many Los Angeles artists and architects. Today's program is in some ways motivated by our acquisition of Ed Ruscha's Streets of Los Angeles archive, over 500,000 photographs uh, of Los Angeles spanning 55 years. And we've produced two ways to go into that archive, either through 12 Sunsets, which is a record of 12 documents of Sunset Boulevard over a 55-year period, or through the research collection viewer that also gives access to many other streets that Ed Ruscha photographed. But I think one of the important things is that Ed Ruscha's Los Angeles is only one Los Angeles. And tonight we're gonna get to hear about Edgar and Julian's Los Angeles. Before I turn this over to Zana Gilbert, I should also say that because we're talking about the land and streets of Los Angeles, that I want to acknowledge that I am standing and many others in Southern California on the traditional and ancestral land of the Tongva people. So welcome again and uh, I'm going to turn things over to Zana Gilbert. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Zana Gilbert. I'm from the curatorial department at the Getty Research Institute. And it is my deep pleasure to welcome Edgar Arsenault and Julian Myers Shupinska for this discussion about Edgar's work. As Andrew mentioned, um, Imaginaries of LA is a series of events that's organized in conjunction with the release of the new website, 12 Sunsets. Um, and you can see the face behind me. Um, it presents a vast trove of photos from Ed Ruscha's Streets of Los Angeles archive, um, for which the images of every building on either side of Sunset Boulevard were taken from the back of Ruscha's pickup truck starting in 1965. And then the street was periodically rephotographed by Ruscha and his team over the next five decades. And they continue this project until today. What results is an incredible abundance of information on how the street has and has not changed over time, from being a record of Hollywood's gentrification to what bands were playing at the Whiskey A Go Go over the decades. What this archive provokes for me at this time of global pandemic and reckoning and of disruption or interruption to our normalized patterns uh, is to consider the histories and the futures of LA and to engage with imaginaries of the city beyond its dominant representation. The questions at the heart of this archive stand as an opportunity to converse with contemporary artists who've engaged the city with their work. At the same time, the archive provokes questions about what it means to create a photographic archive of LA's urban landscape and who has agency in this, um, what stories are highlighted or buried. The next uh, event in the series will be a conversation with the artist uh, Guadalupe Rosales and that will be coming in the spring next year. 
um, and here tonight to help us enter into the questions and I'm sure many other uh, other questions too um, is Edgar Arsenault. He is an acclaimed artist, writer and director. He studied at Art Center and Cal Arts and his drawings, installations, video and film works often use complex arrangements of association to create points of contact between implausible relations to investigate the way that historical events shape our present day understanding. Arsenault directed his first play, Until, 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 at Performer in New York City in November 2015 and was awarded the Malcolm McLaren Best of Show Award. His new play, film and installation is entitled Boney Manili and is loosely inspired by the infamous pop duo Millie Vanilli. The work will premiere in 2022 at the Center for the Art of Performance at UCLA and Suzanne Vilmette Los Angeles projects. Solo exhibitions have been presented at the Vera Liss Center at MIT, the Hammer Museum and the Studio Museum in Harlem, among a number of others. Julian Myers Shupinska is an art historian and editor based in LA. He's a scholar of contemporary art exhibitions and the politics of space. He was founding faculty in the graduate program of curatorial practice at the California College of the Arts. And he was senior editor of The Exhibitionist, a journal of exhibition making until 2017. Since 2011, Myers has worked with Joanna Shubinska on the critical collaboration Grupa OK. Over the last decade, they've produced projects for SFMOMA, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Museum Sztuki Łódź in Poland and other institutions. Maya's dialogue with Edgar Arsenault has taken many forms, among them the book, Hopelessness Freezes Time of 2011. So now I'm going to pass things over to Edgar and Julian to begin their presentation. I'll rejoin them at the end for the Q&A. Um, and we invite you to contribute your questions um, in the Q&A box throughout the talk. And Julian and Edgar are going to endeavor um, to have a look at them as they go through, but we'll try and catch all of the questions at the end. So I'm gonna pass it over. Thank you so much, Edgar and Julian. Um, thank you, um, Andrew, Zana, uh, Chelsea, and all the others at the Getty for helping to organize this event. And of course, to the audience, um, um, uh, everyone here to listen. Um, it's our task today to talk about Los Angeles from different perspectives. Um, for my part, I'm a recent arrival to LA from Northern California, where I was based for 20 years or so. Edgar, by contrast, was born and raised in LA. Um, he went to art school here. Um, he teaches here at USC. Um, he's represented by Suzanne Gilmetter, uh, uh, an important and influential LA gallery. Um, Edgar lives and works here. Um, and nevertheless, um, it, uh, the city um, has not been a kind of central subject matter of your artistic practice. Um, in some ways, Los Angeles is your home base um, and production zone, um, as it is for so many industries. Um, it is your social and familial sphere, a kind of studio space um, in which you kind of view the world and project to the rest of the world. Um, for today's conversation, of course, we're going to focus on two projects where Los Angeles has figured explicitly in your work. Um, 107th Street Watts, um, a photographic sequence and um, art book produced in 2003, which was linked to your role as director of Watts House Project, um, an artist-driven neighborhood redevelopment organization. Um, and uh, King Terminator, an ongoing um, film project produced in collaboration with Kurt Foreman, which was initiated five or six years ago. Um, and so we're going to engage those two projects in terms the, of the central questions of the Imaginaries of LA series, um, those being how do artists picture or register the urban space of Los Angeles? How do artists work within and against the historical record um, against the grain of official institutional or municipal stories, or conversely against common knowledge, what everyone accepts as true without thinking about it. Um, uh, the series asks what role 
um, does lived experience play and in what fraught or complicated relationship to urban imaginaries. And I thought we might think a little bit further about this term imaginary, um, because I think it's useful for thinking through Edgar's practice. In psychoanalytic terms, the imaginary points to the role of images in uniting or making whole the fragmented body in pieces of early childhood. In sociology, the imaginary stands for, as uh, Jürgen Habermas put it, the massive background of an intersubjectively shared life world, a massive background consensus that governs lived experience. Um, these descriptions resonate, I think, powerfully with Edgar's practice. His work dwells on the space of the cultural imaginary in order to show its working and anatomize its pieces. He makes visible the broken or fragmented contents of our two convenience and in some senses fraudulent moral lessons and cultural narratives. Among these, um, and this is a central subject that we'll discuss today, is a sort of riot mythology that adheres for generations to particular American cities and neighborhoods, often those uh, neighborhoods in which black and brown people live and that have extensive effects on their urban infrastructure, their social world, their historical memory and more. Now to convey this in terms of Edgar's practice and to kind of get us to LA, Edgar and I thought it would be useful to quickly talk about Edgar's approach to a different urban imaginary that he and I have worked together on, that of Detroit um, before circling back to LA. Edgar, do you wanna add anything in the meantime? No, I was just gonna say, I'm, I'm excited about having this talk with you and that I'm uh, excited that so many people have joined us today. And that uh, just my little riff on your conversation about holes is that I'm inside of a new uh, studio that I just moved into on Monday. So it's, it's not very big, though it may sound that way. Uh, so there's not anything on the walls um, at this point. Um, this is the intro screen, which should have been up while I was talking. Um, and this is the basic structure. Um, we hope to talk for about 30 or 40 minutes, um, so maybe 10 minutes each section. So part one um, focuses us first on Detroit. Um, and Edgar, maybe you can take it from here to talk about what we're seeing um, in this image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, um, this is the site that's at the intersection of uh, Claremont um, and 12th Street, which I think now is, is it called Rosa Parks Boulevard? Is 12th Street now Rosa Parks? Yeah, they may have renamed it. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the, the, the story of us visiting this location is that um, Julie and I have been talking about Detroit for a long time, um, about the city, um, especially in, because of, a, of an earthwork that the artist Michael Heiser had done here in the early 70s, where he dragged a, uh, a giant monolith across the Detroit, lawn, Detroit Art Institute lawn, which then resulted in uh, um, one of the great sort of earthwork disasters. Um, so when uh, when Julie and I had decided to come to Detroit, it was during the Super Bowl. I think it was when the Detroit Lions, no, it wasn't Detroit Lions, it was in Detroit in uh, 2006. And we said, you know, hey, Julian, we got to get down there because in the New York Times, it says that they're rebuilding uh, all of Detroit. We need to get down there and see it before uh, before they radically transform the city. Having like no idea about just how vast and big it was, so we you know we then a week we jumped on an airplane, we got to Detroit, and we had all of these ideas about what we're going to encounter. And one of those first myths was that the downtown was really the only thing that got a facelift, and anything outside of that like one mile um, was more or less um, erased. So we wanted to go to this site, um, which you're seeing a photograph of, which this is the, the place where the Detroit uprising, the, the Detroit riots um, in 1965 um, had- uh, Seven. 67, thank you, had, had jumped off. Um, this plaza um, is the only marker of that building, um, which stood there at the time, which was known as a, as a blind pig. And, a blind pig was an underground drinking establishment in the city um, of Detroit where people could go and, uh, and have a cocktail. 
because of the, the way in which segregation, go ahead, you can go to the next slide, okay. uh, which segregation um, existed in the city. Um, it was in that basement uh, where there was a party for a, a number of guys who just came back from Vietnam um, and the police raided it after hours, uh, wound up arresting, was it more than a hundred people? Yeah. Yeah, more than a hundred people. Um, and according to the story, as I remember it, once the last people were dragged and put inside of the police cars and driven away, which took hours. And since this was in a residential neighborhood, people were really coming out of their houses and was like, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on? Um, and the police being as a police are um, in black neighborhoods, it was very aggressive. And when the last police car pulled away, supposedly a bottle or brick hit the back of the windshield, hit the back of the car, broke it out. And then that was the spark that set off um, uh, the uprising in 65, 67. Yeah. And so this site became a kind of resonant focus for um, bodies of work that uh, kind of traversed a number of years for you. So I thought that we would give a little bit of a sense of what some of that work is, um, looking at a few different versions of it. Uh, this is a slide that just points to um, um, the extent of these riots. It, uh, as we came to learn about this historical event, um, um, we were just kind of struck and blown away that there had been this kind of military occupation of an American city um, and a suppression of uh, an insurrection. Lyndon Johnson had declared um, at the request of Governor George Romney, uh, 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 he had invoked the Insurrection Act um, and called in um, two um, airborne divisions of the, uh, the U.S. Army. Yeah, um, yeah, go ahead. I said I was just adding and the National Guard. Right, so Detroit police, Michigan sheriffs, um, the Michigan National Guard and then two airborne divisions. Um, so you had um, kind of a massive um, um, uprising and urban um, kind of street fighting um, going on in an American city that was then uh, suppressed by um, serious military force um, in a way that um, kind of inter will recur through our discussions of Watts and um, LA in 1992 um, of um, kind of evocations of Vietnam, Iraq. Um, this is very much as um, a, a version of bringing the war back home um, yeah. through forms of military policing and suppression of, of, of urban resistance. And so going back to the site, um, um, the site was in 2006 when we first visited it, um, not marked as such, except by a sculpture that we discovered when we got there, um, which at the time uh, it had no signage, no markers. Um, it was just, uh, just there um, uh, gesturing very ambiguously to this um, past event that was um, kind of seared into the memory of Detroiters, but um, un unmarked, anonymous. Um, later has been kind of um, um, uh, uh, fixed up and, and uh, the park now has a name, Gordon Park. Um, the, uh, the sculpture here uh, has, has uh, uh, an attribution, um, an artist called Jack Ward. Um, and at that time, um, during this visit, Edgar placed a kind of anti-monument or counter-monument on one of the, um, the tables. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, about that, Edgar? Yeah, I mean, I, it was something that I was working on in my studio because I was I was at Art Base at the time in San Antonio. Um, and I don't remember exactly what inspired it, um, but I was thinking about the grid of the city. Um, so when I made it with hot glue, you know, I set it on the table just as a way of acknowledging the space. But, you know, we, we call it an anti-monument just because I figured within three or four days, the whole thing was gonna fall apart. Um, so these, these two objects sat opposite each other um, in this courtyard. But one of, the, one of the things that 
um, really inspired me and, and Julian in our conversations over the last 10 years is how reaching the site was, was anticlimactic in a way. Um, because the very thing that we went there to find was the thing that this plaza um, had actually uh, covered up. So the, the plaza itself had no markers that said that this is the site where the, you know, the, the Detroit uprising had begun. The only thing that sat there was this very mysterious metal um, object. I mean, I had no idea that, that this object was there at the time. We didn't know who the artist was. And, you know, later on, as I, as I look back at this gesture of setting this object on the, on this chess table and its juxtaposition to this, to this object, it, it started to remind me of 2001, a space odyssey, you know, like, you know, that the, that the uprisings that were happening were this um, um, revolutionary rise in consciousness, you know, that um, in the same way that in the film 2001, that the monolith had, you know, triggered consciousness and pre uh, historic uh, human and prehistoric humanity that this object had come there in this kind of mysterious way and had done the same thing. Um, but also knowing that like beneath all of these pretty stones was that basement where that party was and that the this, this soil had sort of filled it all in. And I, you know, and I, I just spent years just kind of pondering upon that space that was beneath our feet um, that at one point was a vacancy and now has sort of been collapsed back into and like how to be able to express that. Um, at least for me, it kind of registered as a kind of paradox, you know, like a historical mm -hmm. paradox, you know. Um, and you, you continued on to think about the kind of, like a, to picture these sort of ruins in this kind of non-space. Um, um, these are ver uh, different versions of the blind pig and there are, you know, sort of a dozen of these kind of large yeah. works. Um, floating kind of in a uh, not not uh, linked or belonging to any particular landscape, floating free. Um, can you talk a little bit about those projects? Yeah, it might be a little bit difficult to see this, but if, if you were to do a Google search, you should be able to find some of these images. Um, but that abandoned house um, is floating on a, on a slab of earth that's uh, made up of layers of a stratum. Um, and inside of that house, um, you can see the basement, but the depth of the basement is far deeper than the depth of the stratum itself. Um, so the, the basement is like, you don't see the bottom of it, but it's definitely deeper than the, than the slab. So it was just a way for me to produce a kind of um, visual paradox um, to think about that, that history that had been um, submerged. And here's, uh, here's another version. Um, again, this spatial paradox in which there's this kind of strange um, kind of uh, upside down and right side up space. Um, this work for me calls up, I think, um, the inverted houses that you're producing early on as this kind of figure or allegory of how um, history is present but uh, erased um, in space. Yeah. Yeah, and this, this one is, um, and I, I know we're, we need to, to move on to the next one, but this is that, um, that plaza that we just saw the photo of that I left the Anti Monument in. And then that, there's a, a singular tree that I remember that was in one of the planters. So those, those rectangular forms are the planters themselves. And then the, the building to the right of it um, is me imagining what the building looked like that the blind pig was in. Um, just because we couldn't find any photographs of it. So this is just me sort of projecting again into that space, just thinking about, you know, as above, so below. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the tree is just a way for me to symbolically to talk about, you know, root structures that, you know, these, these relationships are deeply embedded um, and the, uh, the forces that inform them are expansive, um, but sometimes they just barely kind of poke their head above the surface. Mm. And then, one more slide from the Detroit series. Um, a couple yeah. of these collages that you produced that juxtapose um, um, language from the Detroit techno movement of the yeah. 80s and 90s, um, um, different figures of, of waves crashing um, against the kind of uh, reportage of the, um, of, the, of the riot itself. 
Yeah, how, how are we doing time-wise on this section? Uh, I probably need to hop to forward. Yeah, well, let me let me just make one point about this. And this, yeah. in this work, um, you know, it was because once we got to Detroit, we got to meet the, the musicians, Underground Resistance. And if there's any, like, techno heads in the room, you guys would have to know um, you are. But I, I would say that, like, meeting those musicians was the embodiment of the problem of the stories that we tell ourselves about cities. In particular, that you know, Detroit was a city in decline, and then by extension, that the people who live there are also in decline. Um, working in working in Watts, you know, in a in a neighborhood, you know, I was inspired by the same ideas that the stories that we tell ourselves about buildings and about architecture um, is not the story about the people who inhabit the cities, and that oftentimes when you actually do. Um, allow yourself to be in the space and get to know people and get to learn about their experiences and their practices. Um, oftentimes you discover that not only are they making interesting work, but more interesting work than in, uh, than in most places where you've been. And techno music like Underground Resistance, you know, is dealing with algorithms, not algorithms, dealing with waveforms. So this is a way for me to be able to try to talk about that music, you know, um, and then those holes in the history, right? These uh, black um, uh, absences that exist inside of this. Again, a kind of like a paradoxical relationship, like there should be no holes um, when it comes to oceans. Um, well, it strikes me that, that this kind of, the sense of like trying to give shape to the kind of history and, and its, its gaps as well as this kind of move that's that's common to a lot of your practice of actually um, rooting it in a kind of firsthand social encounter actually moves us really neatly to um, thinking about um, the work you did and Watts. And so why don't we move forward there to part two, okay? Yeah. Um, so this is um, a, a book, um, uh, an accordion fold book. Um, called 107 Street Watts um, um, that is produced um, kind of in relationship to a massive um, kind of outsider sculpture produced by uh, an Italian immigrant named Sim uh, Simon Rodia um, in Watts um, between 1921 and 1954. So can you talk a little bit about um, uh, how you came to organize this project around the Watts Towers yeah, yeah. You know, like um, you know, like Andrew was talking about earlier that there's lots of different Los Angeleses. And you know, and I, I was, you know, I was born and raised in South Central LA off of, you know, 70th and Cimarron, which is maybe a 20 minute drive on the street down to the Watts Towers. But you know, as a kid, I never visited it. You know, we just learned about it in school. Um, and I remember like the first time that I went there thinking that this, these towers are going to stand as tall as the Eiffel Tower. Um, but, you know, they're 100 feet tall and they're nestled right in the middle of a residential neighborhood. And the, the thing that had brought me there was that I had met the artist Rick Lowe, um, who is the, one of the co-founders of Project Row Houses in Houston. And he was uh, um, working on an exhibition at MOCA called Uncommon Sense that it invited a number of artists like himself, Meryl Euclides, Mel Chen, to come to LA and to do projects that typically exist outside of the museum framework and um, to try to, to locate something in LA. So when I met Rick, um, he was just zeroing in on Watts as a site. Um, so within like three months of me graduating from my undergrad at Art Center, I was in this major exhibition at MOCA and, you know, was attending community meetings with him back in 97, mm -hmm. um, you know, getting to know the neighbors and the, and the neighborhood. And one of the things that I realized was that I wanted to figure out um, a solution of how to document this neighborhood in a way which really showed you its, its continuity mm -hmm. um, and that the towers themselves, which is so tall and, and grandiose, and you can see here, um, is, uh, is, is wrapped within a band of, of houses. Um, so I started photographing the towers um, from this angle because I wanted to show um, this sort of undeveloped land on the other side and then make my way back around. Um, 
But I, 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 I do need to mention that when I shot these photographs um, back in 97, it actually, you know what, I think I actually shot these in 96, um, that I didn't even know who Ed Ruscha was or that the Sunset Strip was a thing. Um, it, was, it was introduced to me years, uh, a couple years later by a, um, by a German art collector who was like, oh yeah, you know Ed Ruscha. And I wanted to you know, come across as being uh, ill-informed. I was like, oh yeah, of course I know about him. There's no internet, so I had to go to like a library and dig this shit up. Um, and it was later on that I decided that with this book, I wanted to have a conversation with Bruchet. Um, hmm. Even though our two methodologies of documenting um, a neighborhood, at least on the surface are similar, but I think there's some fundamental um, key differences that are, uh, yeah. that are sign yeah, significant yet subtle. I definitely want to get get to that. Um, I wonder if you could talk, well, a little bit about um, this is this is a, a photo of a crowd watching structural testing of the Watts Towers in 1959. Um, yeah. One of the things that I think is really fascinating about um, your photography here is the way that um, the towers are sort of encased in this support structure um, of scaffolding. I know that was uh, sort of meaningful to you, but it's 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 not a monument that is sort of in a moment of standing on its own. It's it's very much uh, kind of in a process of of kind of uh, precarity and, and yeah. You know, let me let me say uh, something and then let me say something and then and tie it to that other image is that yeah. When I was when I was um, working on that on the on the project with Rick is where I had learned about um, the cultural crescent master plan that had come out of the 1965 um, uh, uh, national or federal response to the, uh, mm. uh, to the, to the uprisings uh, that had happened in LA um, and that they were supposed to do all of this redevelopment work um, on this very land that that truck is parked, um, mm. but that the plan was so expensive and so bloated that it wound up getting shelled. And this is a, a thing that, that um, that government agencies do is that they bog these very needed investments in community within so much um, red red tape and administrative um, um, bureaucracy that they want to just never being um, uh, realized. Um, so I shot that image of the scaffolding because it was a way for me to show that like those ga that scaffolding had been on there for years. So for many people who would come and visit the towers, they probably thought those were the towers, right? Mm. Um, so I wanted to document that. So there was a kind of a um, a critical, a, a kind of a criticality I was I was attempting to engage with at that time. Um, but now that I think about it, there's, there's a sort of a similar kind of connection to that basement idea, mm. right? Mm -hmm. It's the thing that's inside the thing, right? You can't actually see it, but it's because of its absence that mm. it kind of takes on a, even a, a kind of greater meaning. But to, the, to this point about the, um, the city kind of grappling with Rodia is mm. that, um, you know, after he uh, wound up leaving the, the towers uh, to a neighbor, who actually I believe tried to turn it into a taco stand at one point, <laughs> um, they decided that the towers were a, uh, 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 potentially could fall down and that they wanted to pull them down. So this truck was set up to kind of pull the towers down. This is part of the mythology of Simon Rodia's um, like amazing engineering is that it actually wound up breaking the truck, mm. right? And, um, but it caused significant cracking and damage to the tower, um, mm. which then later on, um, the, they had to figure out ways of repairing. So I wanna, um, you mentioned that earlier that you didn't know when you were taking these photographs about um, Ruscha. Yeah. Um, were you, was um, knowledge about the kind of history of, of Watts and the uprisings in 65 part of your kind of, um, was, was that uh, on your radar in, in your worldview? You were born after these happened. Was it a part of common knowledge or suppressed or how was what was your relationship to it I mean you knew about it I mean you know Watts was that place that was that people talked about with a kind of infamy but you didn't entirely understand the magnitude of it. you just knew that it was 
that there was something bad about it and that you needed to be careful if you were to go there. Um, which was not my experience when I traveled there the first time, you know, it was actually really lovely. And mm. the people there in the neighborhood were, you know, very welcoming. Um, and that, that, really, uh, that really struck me. But it wasn't until I started talking to people like John Outerbridge and um, uh, artists like him, or Willie Middlebrook or mm. Mark Greenfield, you know, like all these people who were directors of the Watts Towers Art Center um, mm. that I really got filled in on um on this history hmm. yeah i mean as, as i was reading around um in advance of our conversation i was really struck by the extent to which um the advocacy for strong military style policing really does have a kind of origin in the lapd's response to watts um uh, yeah. police chief william parker for example, um, coined the term the thin blue line um, in this moment. Um, uh, I mean, this is this is the um, in in the aftermath of Watts is when um, Martin Luther King uh, says this this uh, kind of thing that he says a number of times that the riot is the language of the unheard. Mm. Um, so all of this kind of ideology and kind of ideological material, imagine, imaginary material um, kind of comes into coalescence directly around um, Watts. Um, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, the, 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 the I think some, sometimes the best way to learn about your own city is to, to go someplace else and look at it from a distance, hmm. right? So, you know, seeing those images of tanks rolling down the street you know, what that, to me, that was like the, the zeitgeist of, um, of the, uh, these dried up um, uh, auto, auto manufacturing plants, you know, that people being disenfranchised from um, those jobs because they were being shipped overseas. Um, so it was like, it was the zeitgeist of those industries that had started to shrink and caused all of this, um, socioeconomic disparity like it, it it came back to haunt them like a ghost mm. you know, like the the tanks that um that were built during world war ii you know those industries that were in la that you know tens of thousands of black folks moving from the south came to la for you know and those jobs left those industries left but all because of redlining you know people are still coming and moving into these communities that have you know, far little resources than they deserve, mm. you know, so the response to, uh, to this marginalization is, uh, is an increase in force. Right. You know, at the highest level, which is, you know, tanks and, uh, and machine guns. You know, um, so in this, in this image that we're seeing on the right, you know, this Operation Teacup, you know, What's, what's really nice about this photo, just from a historical perspective, just so we don't go too far off, um, that one of these houses is the original Watts Towers Art Center. Now, I couldn't tell you which one, but um, after 65, and this is before, um, before, the, before the riot, um, I think you told me, Julian, mm -hmm. is that um, one of the houses eventually became an art center. Uh, and, you know, I, and I could be wrong, like maybe the art center came before the riots, but I'm pretty sure it came after. Um, but there was, there's only one house left on this side of the street now, now the Watts Towers Art Center and all that stuff is here. Um, and oh. the original, I'm uh, sorry, just this one little note. Okay. For listening. Um, the original um, director of, uh, of the art center was the artist Noah Purifoy. And then later on, um, it was handed over to John Outerbridge, two um, LA icons, um, very important artists. Uh, uh, to the LA art scene. So we're a little short on time, so I'm going to move us to part three. Okay. Um, King Terminator. Yeah, let's, can you just go back for one second? I know we're a little bit behind, but I just wanted to say something about the shape of, of my book versus um, in relation. Yeah. Right, absolutely. Um, so the, the thing which is not in totally um, apparent just by looking at these photographs is that, you know, Ed Ruscha's sunset strip photo just goes in a, in a straight line and you're seeing, you know, the north side of the street and the south side of the street. Um, so it, it, it traverses from A to Z. 
Um, but my my book um, wraps around and produces a uh, um, uh, a cycle, but it never actually reaches the end. You mm -hmm. know, there's a uh, there's a gap um, between the the towers and then the place where the the end of the photo sequence um, terminates. Right. And yeah. you know, for me, that just sort of like me. And this is early in my thinking, and I thought maybe it was it was a kind of a fault of mine, but. Just thinking about it later, it was a way for me to start to think about how history expresses itself through the gaps, you know, through the through the absences. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's there's a lot to talk about here, and maybe yeah, we can return yeah. to some of these images in the Q and A. Yeah, yeah that's um, the same side of the street where those houses are. Is that strip at the bottom that you're seeing right now? Yeah, I'm I'm fascinated with the sort of discontinuities that are going on between the different elements here, um, but it doesn't really completely link up. Um, I think that's really important. Um, so let's talk, um, you know, and sort of quickly about the third project called P King Terminator. Um, this is another of your projects that um, is built out of um, thinking through the kind of um, messy coincidence of of, of uh, multiple events. So, do you want to talk at all about the video before we do? Yeah, just to, just to, just to draw a, um, um, a link uh, between the the three sites that we've looked at is that when we when you and I got to Detroit, we had a certain idea of what we were going to encounter, and then you know. The thing that we saw, like Jack Ward's sculpture in that empty uh, plaza, was was absolutely the uh, was so far outside of our expectation, right? That um, we didn't really know how to handle it, and then or what to do with it. So you know, we spent years thinking about it. And my um, experience with spending time in Watts for you know off and on for fifteen years mm. was that again, it was a place that was like full of projection of you know, anxiety and, and, and infamy, and also wonder with these towers being so tall and magical. Um, and then realizing that there was this incredible gap between what it was and how we were told that it was, you know, and, and then you're just spending years trying to, to build work, kind of bridging that gap. And then, and then this instance of this project, King Terminator, which um, I've been working on off and on with my uh, collaborator, uh, Kurt Foreman, on this project is looking at this very peculiar relationship between Arnold Schwarzenegger and Terminator 2 and the Rodney King beating. Um, and should I should I just share that that strange uh, yeah. coincidence just, a few moments? Yeah, I mean we could just play the video because it sort of yeah yeah, yeah yeah there you go yeah let's play the video. So this is a little trailer, kind of a conceptual. Uh, uh, blueprint of us trying to make sense of this content. We should go to the origin of King Terminator, which was located in uh, the director's commentator by James Cameron. We call this termo vision because we're, we're clever that way. <laughs> <laughs> this was, there's an interesting anecdote here that this bar is right across the street from the place where Rodney King got beat up. Oh, no kidding. Uh, yeah. Literally, they were within 300 feet of each other. about this relationship between the Rodney King beating and Terminator 2 in both fact and, and fiction, they both resulted in the destruction of Los Angeles. I'm using Hollywood um, as a template. Um, these things start resonating with each other and actually produces a, a very compelling and troublesome picture about the relationship between images, um, the stories that we tell ourselves and how it actually results in and real effects within the world.
Yes, I mean, there's this, this, this idea that, you know, I've been exploring and also with my, with my buddy Kurt is to say, you know, entertainment is actually far deeper than we know. Um, and oftentimes the, the products of, of, of popular storytelling is, um, is extracted um, from some of the troublesome uh, uh, realities that we currently live in. So in this photograph, one of the things which is interesting to ponder, which I've, I've been thinking about for I don't know how many years now, is that in the fog of that uh, darkness uh, behind that uh, Hyundai um, is that corral bar where they were filming Terminator 2. And then one of the things that, that is speculated is that um, George Holliday, who shot the Rodney King beating, um, might have been filming them uh, making Terminator that same day. So it's possible that Terminator and the Rodney King beating exist on the same tape. Um, so I, I just keep thinking like, what would it be like to try to walk that gap between the set of Terminator back to the beating and then from the beating back to the set again? Like, you know, how many years of history are we traversing? But where things become even more surreal is that and, you know, this movie comes out in 91. The movie is released in 91, right? Yeah, that's right. Then um, he goes to the video in 92, and then that's when the uprising happens is in 92. A couple years later, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger puts about a million dollars of his own money into Terminator 3, which he then uses as a platform to run for governor, which he does successfully, um, becoming the governor. So I'm, maybe, maybe I'll go through just quickly like a couple of the slides and we'll get to Arnie. Okay. Um, one of the things that really, really struck me um, is, is the idea of, of um, the film itself as this kind of um, dis, disjunctive um, mapping of potential spaces within Los Angeles as um, sort of uh, the city as a kind of production set um, for, <laughs> Um, various filming activities that then kind of be in 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 filmmaking become a kind of composite like fantasy view of the city. Um, um, here you have the Bull Creek Spillway, the kind of um, you know uh, just raw infrastructure, and also um, you know kind of the parking garage at Santa Monica Place um, as this kind of uh, uh, potential spaces that then get kind of activated. Yeah, this is my favorite scenes. I love this movie so much. Um, another thing, just kind of inspired by your um, um, your con your connection of these two, or you know, your exploration of this connection, was the weird fact. Um, I realized that that um, uh, Edward Furlong, throughout the whole yeah, film, well. playing John Connor, is 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 uh, wearing a Public Enemy shirt, a kind of tribute, um, uh, kind of reverse tribute to. Public Enemy, whose DJ had named himself Terminator after Cameron's first film. Yeah, yeah, and I don't I mean, even the director knew that, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 pretty purposeful, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, the Terminator uh, figure then flows throughout, um, you know, uh, um, hip hop, um, jungle, um, um, uh, an early Goldie track is called Terminator. Um, yeah, go to the next slide. Yeah. And then this one, which is kind of oh, getting yeah. where you're going. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, the Messiah. Yeah, the, the, the prototype uh, before our uh, current outgoing uh, uh, leader. Quote, unquote, right. Leader. Yeah. right. And so you see how, how like this kind of this weird transit between fiction and um, militarized policing and, uh, you know, uh, political power. Um, that really does kind of speak to how kind of uh, there is this kind of this uncanny transit in LA between, you know, lived experience and these kind of imagined or spectacular it's, um, experiences. Yeah, and it's worth, it's worth um, uh, speculating, and I, we could probably say the most likely is true, is that the last time I was in Detroit and I went and visited um, the site of uh, 12 and uh, Claremont, there was a giant sign there that then recognized the the, his, the 
historical significance. And I'm almost certain that that sign was generated after Patty Jenkins made the movie Detroit. Oh, uh, Catherine Bigelow. Catherine Bigelow, I'm sorry, yeah, Catherine Bigelow. Was, made uh, 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 used to be married to James Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> Weirdly. No, I'm like their bastard, I'm like their bastard stepchild or something. Um, so, so I thought um, this is really where the kind of three chapters end and where we transition to Q&A. Um, so maybe Zana, you can come back online. Um, I thought that one thing that I wanted to kind of point to is, is how like we might actually use these projects to sort of think towards the present. Um, this is just a snapshot of mine um, of um, kind of protesters and police um, in, uh, on May 30th um, on Third Avenue um, with trash fire and tear gas kind of flowing around the, um, the, the, the intersection of uh, between kind of between Pan Pacific Park and the Grove. Yeah. Um, and I also kind of wanted to put into just kind of the view of 2020, like um, the aftermath of the uncanny emptiness of LA and the aftermath of those protests. Um, um, Dodger Stadium waiting for a COVID test, um, um, you know, sort of smoke choked sky and sun. Um, that, that this kind of, that my experience as a recent transplant to LA is, is uh, you know, these are, these are some of the experiences and images and spaces that kind of speak to my experience, um, you know, this uncanny emptiness of the last um, several months. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Zana, um, can you take Well, a thank you. Um, thank you so much uh, to both of you for this, um, extremely rich talk. Um, I would like to invite people um, to throw in any questions that they have. And um, I think uh, we'll, you know, six o'clock, but we will um, stay for probably another 15 minutes to have um, a Q&A. So please let us have your questions. Um, one of the things that um, really stands out for me in your discussion is thinking about the sort of tensions between um, these different points of history, sort of on the one hand, revealing what's hidden, and the, on the other hand, not allowing that to sort of overturn, uh, overdetermine the reading of, of a place, of a site. And I wondered how you feel about sort of treading that line between um, you know, the focus on a site like with the Blind Pig series to try and kind of reveal the history in a counter narrative. Um, yeah. And then on the other hand, you know, in the Watts, uh, 107th Street Watts project, there's this kind of attempt to recharacterize how it's been overdetermined. But of course, those two places have been received in very different ways. So I'm wondering, um, you know, what you think about like where the, where the line is between those two sort of difficult positions. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think the Sunset Strip, <clears throat> I mean, if it was in the 60s, I mean, that was a place of infamy, at least, you know, where the bars, the clubs, mm -hmm. drug scenes, the counterculture. So, I mean, you know, that, that, that has changed, at least by the time that I became an adult, you know, that was the place of coolness and slick cars and beautiful women and style and, and fashion. But, you know, those, uh, those seedy aspects of that um, history is still there. It's just that, you know, it's not the part which is the, you know, it's just sort of been pushed. It's just been pushed beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. The desire to have those experiences hasn't gone anywhere. It just got priced out, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but I, 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 and I talk with my students about this is that I think that in, in many ways that the truth is actually expressed in the gaps. Right, it's the it's the place between the recent um, past and the present. It's the 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 echo of um, you know the the fog of history, where you're like, where did this come from? Why is it standing here alone in this kind of odd way? It really stands out. And then when you just you start to scratch the surface, you realize that it's part of this kind of you know ripple effect that's been spreading out over time. And that was, that was the thing that I learned about working down in Watts was <clears throat> that this neighborhood looked the way in which it did because of the decisions that were made, you know, decades before I was even born. 
Um, so like, what do you do with that in the present, right? So that's always my question. It's like, where do we go? So that's why I have these buildings floating in these strata. So like, what direction is this going in? I mean, and clearly we have a very neoliberal kind of uh, uh, direction that the country's going in currently. But there's also a lot of hope, you know, with the protests and stuff that have been happening too. I guess- yeah, no, I, Go ahead. Oh, sorry, go on. I was just going to ask a follow up question and then I'll turn to some of the questions that are in the Q&A box, um, which is kind of, I, I wanted you to elaborate, if you would, on like what you think the role of fiction is. And, and I also I really like the way both of you discuss this idea of the timescape. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered if you would talk about that in relation to sort of what's the role of fiction in sort of creating an imaginary that can uh, impact upon the future. And I think you showed like the very dystopian version of it in the mm -hmm. King Terminator, you know, in that this idea of like producing the reality uh, mm -hmm. with this like fascistic militarized army of the Terminator, mm -hmm. you know, versus, you know, the, the sort of reality TV that has become like a political scenario. Um, but so what I'm wondering is like, is there a role for, for fiction, which I guess would, you know, come down to like, can art produce these imaginaries, which hopefully your answer would be yes. I, I, I can maybe address this a little bit, Edgar, you, you can follow. Um, and it seems to me that, 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 that these histories are, are kind of exist in a state of contradiction. On the one hand, um, um, you know, as, as, Mike Davis says about the 92 riots, um, there's a kind of conspiracy of silence that follows, like a kind of lack of dealing with it, lack of action, lack of dealing with it. On the other hand, they are overdetermined by their cultural forms. Um, and so there's, they're, both, they're both like overdetermined and underdetermined at the same time. Um, and we somehow in dealing with those, historic, in those histories, we have to deal with both at the same time. And in the same way, I think that you know, something that's central to the way that Edgar and I think about these histories is that um, that there is no kind of easy juxtaposition between um, the ideological and the lived. Um, they are not they are not separate. Um, in fact, um, the the lived is is populated and and permeated by desire, fiction, projection, um, all kinds of things. Ideology mm -hmm. itself. Edgar, do you want to pick up? Well, I mean, if we were talking about fiction, um, you know, living in LA, I mean, you can encounter 15 film shoots if you just drive around, right? So, I mean, we, we live in a place in which stories are constantly being spun, but, you know, the vast majority of them are selling products or, you know, are big budget stories, which means that, you know, there's a certain kind of convention that those stories must maintain. But you know, I don't. I don't take a. I don't. My issue is not with that because, as I was saying with King Terminator, is that oftentimes the politics are there. They just exist in the background. But you just have to bring them to the foreground, right? Um, so I think that this kinds of stories that I like to tell are the ones that take a story that you think that you know, right? So that you can. I just want to. I want to seduce you to come along with me uh, to explore this subject, and then you know crack open a wall where you thought there was no depth, you know, show that there's a fissure there, and then there's, there's all of this kind of wisdom, or there's all of these questions that were relevant in 65 that are still relevant in 2020, right? Like why hasn't those, uh, why have those questions remained the same? Um, and that's something- Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. And I see some of the questions are, are, are so let me ask you some of the questions um so the first one that came through was um it seems like the apop the apocalyptic quality of 2020 images um is in a way the arrival to what to everyone what has been mostly experienced by black folks forever i was in what's in 1965 to 7 with my boyfriend's mother who was a social worker um any uh, response uh, to that? So it was my boyfriend's mother who was a social worker. Okay, yeah. Um, apocalyptic. Yeah, I mean, you know, COVID was a kind of, um, it by no means was an equalizer, 
But what it did show was, um, uh, you know, the, um, I want to say, uh, the story that, that the news tells us is that, you know, that the poor are deserving of that condition either because they didn't work hard enough or, you know, they came from a bad community or something like that. But now you have millions of people who now have very little social safety net. And then they realize that they themselves are put in that exact same economic uh, precarity. Um, so, you know, the, the, the protests that happened on the street, I mean, you know, you have so many different people from different uh, communities that were uh, coming together. And it was because, you know, there was a kind of a shotgun was taken to that illusion of, uh, of deserving and non-deserving, right? Um, and that the stability of the middle class is actually just like three paychecks away into, you know, being uh, on welfare or government assistance. Um, but I, I don't, so I don't... Um, we have a question from um, Joanna Shupinska. Um, Edgar, in your investigations of American history and sight, you often turn to moments of rebellion. What first drew you to these instances of civil unrest as starting points for your art practice? Yeah, I, you know, it was something that I came to just because, you know, like I say, you look at like, you come across something, you wonder why it's there, um, what created those conditions, and then you start looking out further and then you discover something. Um, so, you know, the, the riot as a, as, a, as a site is really interesting to me because you can think about society as a, almost like an individual, but as a social body, right? And it's when that, that individual will, that desire for, um, uh, for civil rights, that, that desire for uh, economic stability and the, the ability to climb the ladder um, you know, when that kind of, when that clashes against, um, the body politic, you know, against the government, when it's a, that will, you know, meets that resistance and they become, is a kind of an, it's like a splashing of a wave and it kind of, and it produces all of these effects, which potentially, um, could be kind of a, it could result in a kind of baptism of the flesh, meaning like that through the flames that there's a, you know, sort of a new, uh, society could be born. But oftentimes within the US that, that, that collision is treated as criminality, not as people actually saying, that, that, that making claims that are, are, that are legitimate. So I, I, I find myself going back to that subject over the years, um, uh, just because it, 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 it keeps asserting itself as being a, a conversation that needs to be had. You know? Well, and there's a counter conversation to that, which is, to sort of just delegitimize like wholesale mm -hmm. any you know frustration or um, any like attack on property or you know so it's it's um, you know constant sort of push back and forth on those terms of that debate. Yeah, yeah. So those are neoliberal um, ideas that property is a sign of democracy. You know, I mean, when people build a target goes up in flames, and we're supposed to feel like, you know, oh my God, you know, that poor target, that, that building is so well insured. You know what I mean? Like, who cares if the target burns up? I think, I think for, for, for both of us in different ways, um, these moments signal a kind of volatility, but also possibility, a kind of moment of social opening. Um, I, I, I don't actually think about, um, these things in apocalyptic terms at all. In fact, I think I, I would say that, that that apocalypticism is much more a figure of the political right who wants to motivate them in, in terms of um, enforcing a particular narrative and, and uh, class, class and race, race uh, situation. Um, the, other, the other thing that the question calls up for me, though, um, it, Edgar, is that we sort of started this, uh, this kind of exchange back and forth between us um, in the aftermath of the failure of the um, protests against the Iraq war in a moment in which kind of street protest felt um, as if it had been kind of powerless to stop this kind of uh, 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 the forward motion of the, the military um, invasion of Iraq. Um, 
and the sense in which there was a sense in which I think that we wanted to recover, dwell upon, uh, kind of work through um, those moments um, in our kind of as as a way of just preserving the sense of possibility that we thought was somewhere within them. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we have another question from uh, William O'Donnell here. Um, how do you approach or encourage accessibility to your art for those outside the art world or in forms other than public art as a way to shift the narratives, question media norms and open up the conversation? Yeah, that's a, that's a big um, question. And I would, I would say that, um, that A, you, you mean, one needs to recognize that not all languages are understandable to everyone. Um, like the people who speak Spanish, you know, you have to know how to speak Spanish. Um, but yet I love music in Spanish, right? So the, um, the question is, how do you give, and this may be more theoretical than you want, William, but um, the, the question is, how do you give people access to work, which is both personal as well as archetypal, meaning that they can understand mm -hmm. The, the power dynamic, they can understand the consequences of an arrangement. Um, and then uh, in spite of not understanding what art, what the, maybe they're not well-versed in art history, they can still access those. Um, and I, that, that's some of the stuff that we try to do in Watts by having lots and lots of volunteers come from all over the world and be able to engage the space directly and not just change their minds about the space, but for them to be able to leave some value behind come and paint a house or pour a driveway or something. So another question from Hannah Waiters. Very moving conversation. I've been studying the collaborative project, Hopelessness Freezes Time. And I notice how much Benjamin and the Arcades Project influence your take on these structural paradoxes on urban artifacts. So I'm wondering if Benjamin is still influencing your work today. <laughs> Julian was the one who introduced me to the arcade project. That is one to put that out there. So thank you. Well, let me let me yeah. I, I mean, of course, of course, yes is the answer. But um, I would I would say that um, probably the book that I gave you was not the arcades project. It was the, um, Susan Buck Morse's Dialectics of Seeing. Did I ever um, get that back to you? I think I kept it. No, no, no. I I, I bought I bought another copy. That's a okay. gift. Um, yeah. So so. I would say that maybe maybe even more so than than a direct um, than than the arcades project directly is is kind of our encounter with the working the writing and thinking of Susan Buck Morris. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's well put. And if you guys don't know that book, it's fantastic. So we've got two more questions. I'm going to read them to you, um, and then I think we will wind it up. Um, but uh, so a question from. Emily Scott. So she says, it's great to hear you two talk together again. Um, I, es I especially appreciate your description of the anticlimax of showing up to a site after the moment that marks it along the lines of your attention to gaps, vacancies, etc. Can you speak to the contrast between the lack of documentation of the blind pig and the documentation density or hyper documentation of the Rodney King beating, one of the most shared and analyzed media clips of the last decades, yet also full of and evoking plenty of its own holes mm. and what that contrast brought up for you as image media workers and she said also um she's been thinking a lot about arthur jaffa's love is the message and the mes message is death throughout the talk that's funny julie and i have a, a an interesting history with arthur um <laughs> well I, I'll, I'll because we're short on time i'll just um just talk about that video which yeah mm. it was the first viral video as far as I know. Um, and the fact that it, the, the copy of the copy of the copy, the, the way in which the, um, the snow in the background is, with each copy slowly erased the corral bar and the evidence of the corral bar from the background, um, I think is, is really, really uh, fascinating. Mm -hmm. And that, um, it, it, it shows the direct connection between materials technology and the effects that it has on stories and how we tell those stories. Um, when we tell it over and over again, it always changes it somehow and materially, I think it's expressed really well um, in that, uh, that viral version of the video. I don't know if I've ever seen the original. 
I, I want to say something about about Detroit. Um, the I, you shouldn't get um, from our description of it that that there isn't documentation. Um, it's just we were we were. It's an index of our like initial cluelessness um, and desire. Um, that um, <laughs> one of the strange factors of the kind of sequence of the riots of of sixty seven. Um, is that um, they were uh, uh, journalists and um, uh, sociologists were, at, were, at, were primed by Watts to um, head out to wherever the next uh, insurrection was happening. And so um, by day two, um, Detroit was actually crawling with photographers, sociologists, interviewing people on the street and such. And that generated uh, an enormous mountain of information that was then sort of given form in the, um, the Kerner Commission report, which was itself a, a bestseller selling 2 million copies um, as in, in, as, at, on its release. So there's a, there's a lot of information. <laughs> um, we were just more on. The last question for you um, both. Um, a lovely talk, thank you both. Um, Edgar, you spoke about witnessing some hope through the protests at this moment. Would you talk about your thoughts on hope as it relates to urban imaginaries? Yeah, yeah. Hi, Anna. Um, yeah, that's a that's a tough one. And and actually, my my answer may be very indirect, which is to say that um, in conjunction with the protests, which I think has um, allowed for a lot of um, um, uh, alliances uh, to form between groups that may have not have necessarily seen themselves in alliance with and part of that came from the, um, the, the language that Black Lives Matter has generated just in its very title to say that, you know, you may not like Black people, but our lives do matter and we deserve to live, um, you know, get to know us. Um, but I would say like in conjunction with that in relationship to COVID, which for me is, is, is difficult to, to decouple um, at this moment is that it's allowing people now uh, because of things like Zoom for a certain kind of um, refocusing on the local, right? So like urban communities uh, or any uh, community that might consider themselves to be marginalized now can invest in their own neighborhoods without having to pack up and move uh, to New York and LA because they can, they can engage in these um, in these uh, major uh, cities and networks um, remotely. And then I partially say that um, as a kind of a glimmer of, not maybe not necessarily hope, but a possibility for real local investment um, is seeing how many people are leaving LA and uh, San Francisco because it's just too expensive, but still being able to work here. Um, so I, I, uh, my hope is that there's some people out there that are really gonna try to take advantage of that um, and get people to really invest in their neighborhoods and communities um, and still be able to extract some of the wealth and value um, that you can get from major cities. Well, I would like to thank both of you so much um, for coming to be part of this uh, this evening and um, thank you for sharing your work and um, we hope we'll see you again soon um so thanks everyone um who was able to attend and good night yeah thanks everyone